offense and special there teams. Is, there is not a weakness. I mean, their starters playing all the special teams. We can't. We, we couldn't block anybody yeah. you know, on their special teams. Um, you know, I thought they did a good job, you know, offensively running the football. And when those guys get in space and we miss some tackles, they're gone. We I mean, we, we couldn't catch those guys. Um, they'll be a top 50 team in the country, and they are not the number four team in the county. They're well, the number three team. In the well, Welcome back to the Trina League Football Podcast. I am Dan Albano of the Orange County Register and OCVarsity.com. And you're joined again, we're joined once again by Scott Barajas, our Trina League expert and insider. And we're setting off the show. We got a fine intro from Corona Del Mar coach Dan O'Shea talking about the J. Sarah Lions after an impressive opening week performance by J. Sarah and a very convincing victory. And Scotty, we're going into... Uh, to week one, and how are you doing tonight uh, after that uh, opening week of the season? I'm doing good, Dan. You know, it's uh, now that all the first games are in, you know, we're going to get to dive in and probably reevaluate some teams. Um, even though the Trinity League all went 6 and 0, there were quite right. a few surprises uh, despite all the wins. Um, some new players emerged on the field who we didn't have on radar. You know, a lot of the same names came up big for their team, so. Yeah, it was an impressive week. There were some new uh, new players, and definitely, I mean, I, w- I was at the J. Sarah game. I was super impressed um, by the Lions. I know you went to the Modern Day game and the Servite game, so Scotty double-dipped yesterday. So right now, just going into week one, we've seen uh, three of the Trinity League teams uh, in person, so that's uh, pretty good coverage. Um, going into a, a very big week where uh, we have a national game involving Modern Day and Bishop Gorman. Uh, according to Max Preps, that's uh, what number one in the nation versus number twelve, um, or maybe they have modern day two, right? So it's two and twelve. Yeah, I think so. And, and because there's only one poll that has actually modern day one, I believe, and of the three, I think modern day is like two or three. Yeah. So, but it's a big week, and just to set the uh, the uh, t- the uh, our our set out the parameters of our show tonight, we're going to have recaps of uh, week zero. We're going to have our offense and defensive players of the game for each of those, uh, each of the, each of the schools in the training league, and we're also going to assign our our grades for week zero for each team, and we're also going to have previews uh, going into you know this big week one. Um, it's I mean it, just besides the modern day Bishop Gorman game in Las Vegas, Sky and I will both be in Las Vegas by the way. So the training league football podcast hitting the road, bringing back. Some coverage from the tree from the modern day trip to Las Vegas for Bishop Gorman, but you also have Mission Viejo Santa Margarita, which probably just happens to be the OC Varsity game of the week, probably because it's uh, being played in Orange County and uh, has two OC teams highly ranked in that game. So you know, good selection there. And then you also have Centennial Corona taking on Orange Lutheran, and that's a dynamic game. This is a huge week, uh, Scotty. Um, just off the gate, uh, you know, wouldn't you wouldn't you agree? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, I, I I wish I could watch all of those games. You know, I think a couple of them might be on TV, so I'm definitely going to have to, uh, uh, you know, record them and then uh, watch them later on. Um, but that always seems to happen. They always seem to put the same games in the same weeks, and we you know it would be great if we could have them all spread out where we could all see them at, at the different times. And we're going to have more information on that game. I mean, not to mention also Jay Sarah going to Calabasas. That's another good SoCal uh, game. I mean, uh, th- those are that's a that's a great game. I think uh, Servite Norco could be outstanding. We're going to have some information on that game, but be, on those games. But uh, before we do, we want to thank all the listeners that are checking out the Trinity League Football Podcast. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for returning. Uh, if you're a new listener, thanks for jumping on board and, and tell your diehard football fans that you know that uh, you listen to the Trinity League Football Podcast and they should give it a try because Scotty and I are working hard for you, especially Scott Barajas. So, uh, Scotty, we appreciate all your work you're putting in. So let's, uh, let us, uh, let's review uh, week, week zero, which was an outstanding week. Let's start with that Santa Margarita victory on a Thursday night. It was... Santa Margarita 59 to 21 over Downey. It was the debut of uh, super sophomore quarterback at Santa Margarita, Peter Costelli, who uh, had a huge game, very high percentage 
on his completions, threw for well over 300 yards. Scotty, what was your uh, your take on this game? Yeah, Dan, for a team with a lot of question marks, you know, coming into the season, as we, we talked about, you know, they had to replace a lot of their offensive punch, and um, they showed a lot of promise, scoring 59 points. Um, you know, Peter Caselli in his first varsity start, you know, displayed poise and accuracy. He um, moved well in the pocket, had a couple of great scrambles. Um, as you mentioned, you know, 79% of his passes, 324 in uh, six TDs. And, you know, he, he, he was aided by his offensive line, who we mentioned returned four or five, right. and they dominated. They gave Caselli the time to hit on his passes. And then you know, Jake Thomas also chipped in. Uh, with his 124 yards rushing and uh, one TD, and then uh, defensively the Eagles, you know, kept Kajan Foots in check for most of the most of the game. He did throw for uh, 216 yards. He ran for 113, um, and they did put up 21, but they never threatened beyond that. And uh, Santa Margarita looked pretty good. I mean, they moved well. Um, you know, it, it kind of is reminiscent of of last year's team as far as the same intensity and physicality that they had they just had a lot of new guys and with that being said you know you know it's going to be interesting because now in my mind they've kind of taken that next step up um and uh, to challenge you know they've distanced themselves from that bottom pack that we uh once thought they were going to be wow that is uh that is a big uh, praise there for, uh, for scotty a great uh you know <laughs> Eagle Nation, Eagle Nation, Eagles Nest. Uh, be positive with those words. Scott Bra saying that the uh, Eagles have made another step. This is a uh, year three for for Coach uh, Rich Fisher. So, uh, Scotty, what was uh, what was your grade for uh, for Santa Margarita? So I gave them offensively. Uh, I gave them an A, and on uh, defense, I gave them a B minus. Um, the only little concern was that yeah, they allowed you know, the athleticism of, of Foots to, uh, you know, chalk up yards, but he didn't have a whole lot. Um, and he was kind of doing it all on his own, but, um, uh, it, without a doubt, you know, Santa Margarita did really well in this game, but it was expected. But I, I think, you know, like I said, I think they just, they kind of took, in my opinion, they just went up a step notch than what was uh, intended. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's go to the Monarchs here. Um, they open on Friday, Monday Day, uh, defeated uh, Bishop Amont 42-14. Second year in a row, the guys of these two teams, Monday Day and Bishop Amont, have hooked up in a season opener. Uh, it was Bryce Young's uh, first start as the, uh, you know, as the quarterback of Monday Day. Um, but there were uh, some impressive highlights that came out uh, this game of Brew McCoy, uh, dual threat senior. Uh, a two-way, uh, two-way star, I should say. Um, at, you know, he did look very good at wide receiver, physical, nice highlight. Was posted of him, you know, sh- straight arming uh, an opponent, uh, too much to the ground on a quick out, and then moving up field quickly to gain more yards. He also had two sacks, but it really was the Monarchs' um, other signature was their ground attack. Um, I know you'll have some information on that, but they were very effective on the ground. What was your thoughts in this game, Scotty? Yeah, pretty much, you know, all summer, you know, everyone is that, you know, is advertised as uh, modern day is going to have a new look offense, you know, and a balanced offense featured by its running game with Jacoby Harper and dollars, you know, and on Friday, everyone got to see how potent that attacks will be, you know, Harper reeled off 162 yards, he was averaged 12 yards per carry with the two TDs, and then dollars added 119 yards with three touchdowns. Uh, that did not include his 87-yarder that was called back on a penalty, which would have given him over 200 yards rushing on eight carries. What was that so, penalty, Scotty? It was a holding. That was he was 10 yards past when they threw the hole. So you know, it's one of those those questionable ones. Um, but on that play, I mean, he took a sweep, patiently waited for his blocks, slipped the gap. And exploded down the sideline, blowing by everyone. I mean, everyone looked like they had the angle on him, and he just blew by. And then later, he did that same play for a 50-yard run, and they, they actually, you know, you know, forced him out of bounds. But the running game was consistent all game. Um, however, the passing game was efficient, but it was far from the flashiness that we've, you know, normally see. Yeah. With the, with the Monarchs. Um, Bryce Young connected on 12 of 19 for 108. Um, you know, he hit mostly short passes, and he did overshoot Brew twice on um, 
on some deep slants that would have gone for scores if he would have completed. Um, but you were able to see what Bryce brings to the table with his scrambling ability, and he kept plays alive. Um, and then he had that 119-yard yard rushing TD. And then defensively, modern day held Amat, leading rusher to 37 yards, kept Archuleta in check, passing for 335, and most of that came in the fourth quarter. And then, like we had said, defense led by Brew, but the two sacks caused the fumble, and he also batted down a key fourth down play um, when they tried throwing out a quick out. Um, and he rose, he got high off the ground to, to bat that down. And um, and then he also just disrupt when he was in and not making the actual play. He disrupted the flow uh, for Amat, you know, causing um, havoc, just, you know, like I said, just blowing up the play. So, um you know, and then uh, also we had a junior Moses um, Sepalona who led the way with ten tackles yeah. after coming in for uh, Nate White, who left the game a few plays into the game with an injury. So Sepalona is um, he's kind of a jack of all trades as a linebacker and a safety. You'll see him play all over the place, and he was another one that could have been in the one fifty. Um, but um, the defensive line, you know, finished with with three sacks. An interception by um, defensive back Josh Hunter, who dove freshman defensive back Josh Hunter, who actually dove deflecting the ball in the air, and then Jack Kane Con- made the pick. And again, this was like in the late, with like you know five minutes left in the fourth quarter, uh, with a lot of the starters that were out. So, um, and then as far as the grades go, I, uh, I gave offense a B plus, and I gave their defense an A. Yeah, and then modern day defense was pretty good. Um... Yeah, Monarchs, I think, I know, 369 yards rushing on the ground. Very impressive on 19 carries. So they uh, ran it 19 times, and they passed it, as you mentioned, with Bryce Young 19 times. So as we thought, they, they might, modern day might run the ball more this year, and that was certainly the case. Um, that's quite a duo with Dollars and Harper. And then you, and you mentioned Bryce Young, six carries for 50 yards, including that, as you mentioned, 19-yard uh, touchdown so pretty uh pretty impressive stuff and um what year is uh you know and then you mentioned the uh the injury there at linebacker that that's the one position where modern day coach uh, bruce rollinson has mentioned that he thought they had the some of the most depth even though they've lost um mace funa um you know they that's a position of depth what grade is uh sepalona and um is, what, what kind of linebacker is he uh, moses he's a he's a junior um and he goes about you know, five eleven, maybe one ninety five, but he's you know he impressed me be with his closing speed because he was making tackles from the back side, um, and uh, he's vastly improved from what he was last year, and he could easily be a starter. Um, but I think you're going to see him on the field a lot, um, um, whether it's different packages, you know, and you know filling in for for you know people, but. Um, but yes, they are deep with linebacker more than any other spot that they have. So, and there's a few other kids that that didn't get in that we'll, we'll, we'll probably see as the year progresses making plays. So, all right, let's go to Orange Lutheran, the Lancers, and Ryan Helensky and Kyle Ford and company took on San Juan Hills on the road, and they won twenty-seven to seven down in San Juan Hills. Now, I. This score uh, did puzzle me a, uh, a little bit because I am very high on the Lancers and I, I look at them that I, I kind of expected 30 or 40 points or even more. But maybe I wasn't being, maybe I was being too hard on San Juan Hills because, um, and I, his name will escape me, but they have an excellent defensive coordinator. If it's Robert uh, Friss, defensive coordinator from his days at El Toro, who that uh, that fellow who, I happens to be, uh, I, don't, I, I don't want to say it wrong, but they're they're connected family wise, and he was the coach at El Toro last year. They made a nice playoff run. That guy, I'm pretty sure, is a defensive coordinator at San Juan Hills, and he is outstanding. He is a very good defensive coach. So, and I know, and Robert Fiss is a very good coach, and uh, so I know San Juan Hills is 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 a well coached team, and they were at home, and they had a long time to prepare for this game, but. Uh, I honestly thought they would still be lit up by all the talent at San Juan Hills. So I was perplexed that this was a 20, I mean, I would say only 20 points, but that's how high I am on Olu. And San Juan Hills, 
um, is the you know the favorite in the CV League. They're actually moving down out of the South Coast League down to the second tier. Um, they've never, which they haven't been in for for the last couple of years, and they're gonna. I expect them to dominate the CV League, especially after you know this is a very respectable score for San Juan Hills, um, in my opinion. But um, what did you think of this game, Scotty? And then this score was probably the most surprising. Um, and yet it resulted in a win, but the performance was shocking. With San, you know, Santa Juana Hills gave you know, you know, Olu all it could ha- handle. The Lancers had to work. The Lancers had to work for their scores, as it was only 14-0 at half. I mean, Olu didn't score their final touchdown until a minute and 20 left on the clock. And then Helensky threw for three scores, and you, you know, he was 27 of 49 for 295. And with slot receiver Michael Puskas was on the end of two of those scores. And then Kyle Ford caught seven balls for 116 yards, and he had a great toe-tap touchdown um, uh, catch. But that was pretty much it, you know. But Helensky was also sacked three times, and he was hurried five. Now that comes as an eye-opener because the offensive line was supposed to be an improved than, than it was last year, but yet it yielded the same look from a year ago. Um, so that's kind of concerning, you know, then defensively they kept the Stallions in check. I mean, they only gave up the one third quarter score. So the D got it done and they got two turnovers and both fumble recoveries by Ethan Ray. Um, but, but the Lancers need to make quick work cause they have uh, Centennial next week and it doesn't get any easier. Yes. Uh, and the coach I was thinking about was Mike Merrill. Um, and if he is indeed the defensive coordinator at San Juan Hills, um, but hey, there's some great uh, coaching that goes on in the Trinity League as well. Um, and I know, um, yeah, two of those sacks that you mentioned by San Juan Hills was by they have a BYU offer uh, defensive end um, that is is a good player, um, kind of an under radar under the radar player. Um, I had him in my hot 150. But what was your grades for uh, Lancers then, Scotty? Defense, I gave up a B minus, and on defense, I, I went with an A. Okay. All right, let's uh, let's talk about St. John Bosco. Um, Braves uh, opened up their new stadium last week, um, and they uh, dominated uh, um, against uh, Temp View of Provo, Utah, forty nine nothing. They uh, christened it uh, in well, uh, in, in great fashion. Uh, Braves got their ground attack going um, big time. Uh, Bailey, the receiver, had a big offensive game. Um, DJ quarterback was had similar numbers to uh, to Bryce Young, a fellow junior. But uh, what was your thoughts on this game um, for uh, on the Braves, Scotty? Yeah, I think you know everybody was all stoked for that. You know, playing in their new stadium. You know, they got that forty nine zero win. Um, I mean, it kind of was against an overmatched Tim Few team. I mean, you could see the vast difference between the two. You know, but Bosco's defense, you know, set the tempo on this one, registering five turnovers, four of them interceptions, including a fumble scoop and score by Titus Toller. Uh, Jake Newman, Matthew Jordan, and Taylon Dalton all had interceptions, and more on Dalton in a bit. Um, and all, you know, the Braves held 10th view to 113 total yards, and most of that was in the second half. Um, you know, and they paved the way for the offense to make short drives. You know, but they still managed to do it in you know fine fashion as DJ Una Anelalehi threw for two twenty three touchdowns and two quarters of work with Jake Bailey hauling in two of the scores for a sixty eight yarder and a thirty nine yarder. And then George Halone he led the ground attack with 107, 117 yards and a score. However, they may have lost part of their three headed monster as Nathaniel Jones went down with a knee injury and didn't return. And the reports I'm getting are not promising that he'll be back. So that's a big, it's going to be a big loss for them. Um, but if any, if anybody can take it in with Bosco with their, with their depth, you know, and all it was a good start for Bosco, you know, despite 10 feud, you know, not give him that great look. But one thing is for sure is their overall team speed is all over the field. And, um, you know, so I give them an A on offense and an A on defense. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, getting the shutout, they're the only Trinity League team in the week one to, uh, week zero to get a, a shutout. You know, Jay Sarah, uh, Olu, and, uh, I mean, we'll talk about Jay Sarah shortly, and Servite each gave up uh, 
a touchdown, but uh, impressive for Bosco to get the sh- shutout. And too bad about that injury because I know uh, it was just a, a year or two ago that one of their other running backs uh, um, missed a bunch of time uh, was Flowers. Um, Flowers, yeah. So they've had uh, some bad luck and hope that kid's uh, okay and gets back on the field. So, all right, so A's across. Let us uh, move on uh, to another Thursday night game, which was the uh, an, another uh, debut was by Troy Thomas that returns to return to Servite, uh, coached the Friars for the first time, you know, uh, comes in from Crespi, and um, they head to the Santa Ana Bowl and they get the W in their first game, seventeen to seven. So uh, pretty low imp, uh, output as far as offense. I mean, everyone else. I mean, we're I'm talking about being kind of slightly disappointed or perplexed by Jay, by Orange Lutheran scoring 27 points. And here, Servite scores 17. Defense is fine. But the Friars didn't have a scrimmage. They got some scheduling issues, uh, you know, in this transition year with uh, Coach Thomas. So they didn't have a scrimmage. But uh, I know you were at this game and probably have some more insight. But they did get the win, which uh, they I think it was a game they definitely have to needed to get with the schedule and uh, having a new coach. But what was your thoughts on this game, Scotty? You know, if not for the kickoff return by Zedekiah Centers and the pick six by Carrington Dennis, Servite's looking at 0-1. You know, I mean, it was a game that anticipated Troy Thomas's return, you know, but the highlight of the evening really ended up being the return of the bagpipes and, uh, you know, the signature of Troy Thomas fire-up shadow box, you know, when he leads the team out. Um, <laughs> You know, that seemed to, like, rev up the crowd. Um, it was, you know, fun to see, you know, vintage Troy Thomas back again. Um, but Servite, you know, they struggled to score an offensive touchdown, you know, and move the ball consistently against a Bakersfield team who, you know, and this, this is going to sound bad, but they look like a Sandlot football team. Um, you know, they wow. were disorganized. Uh, you, know, they, uh, you know, they fumbled the ball four times. And it wasn't caused by Servite. It was because they run the option. And a lot of the times they would just – before you know he would just be smashed up into the line and the guy would just fumble the ball or they were just careless um and they were all inside the serve right 20 yard line and they were moving you know they were moving the ball too um you know offensively the friars totaled 230 yards of offense to bakersfield's 218 and servites 42 of, of servites yards came in the final minute of the game so you know they would have been out you know bakersfield you know out um had more offensive output than Servite did um, Blaze McKibben was 14 at third, 23 for 129, but he never looked comfortable in the pocket. He was sacked three times and he was hurried from a defensive line that averaged like 210. Um, you know, and they lined up in an unorthodox formation. They were lined up two yards off the ball and they all lined up standing up. And, and some of them, there were some times where the two ends were kind of boxed in it was the weirdest thing dan so um, wow that sounds it, yeah. all standing up yeah and it, you know it was surprising <laughs> that that to see Servite not be able to dominate the line of scrimmage you know with their huge line um in the running game you know just you know it was just getting kind of that nickel and dime yardage but they never broke broke free um hmm. and then Servite was also without previously mentioned julian alessi yeah um the the, the you know the the athletic receiver from Palos Verdes uh, transfer who was supposed to be one of their main guys this, you know, this year, I guess he decided not to attend Servite and he ended up going back, I believe to Palos Verdes. So that's, that's kind of a loss for them. Um, you know, offensive grades, I'm, you know, it was, I'm going to give him that D and, defense, <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to give him a C. So I, if, if Bakersfield just wasn't in very impressive um, and for Servite only, you know, like I said, if it wasn't for those two scores, you know, they're looking at 0 1. Hmm. That's interesting, Scotty. So the Friars not impressing Scott Barajas, who uh, definitely uh, was looking for some, to be impressed and sound like you were in, in obviously uh, in a good frame of mind. You went and checked out Troy Thomas and you saw some positives. And But I wonder, <laughs> how did Bakersfield get ranked? Were they Somebody was telling me that they were ranked in the, in the state by maybe Cal High. And I, I guess I need to check out those rankings a little bit more, but I mean, I know, I, I know some Servite folks uh, came back with that and said, and I know, I think that was mentioned maybe that, Hey, this was a state ranked team. You know, I, you know, I, I tr- tried this and they couldn't, you know, I tried to, to be taking that into account, but they couldn't throw the ball 
at all. I mean, the quarterback was going to Washington as a defensive player, but I mean, they couldn't throw the ball consistently. Um, they had like four plays that they could run. I, I don't know. I can't see Bakersfield winning any games either. You know, that's the, you know, I know it was the first game for both teams, but to me, also compared to all these other Trinity League games that we've been watching, the team, the overall team speed of that game was slow. And I know Servite's playing with a lot of younger kids and you know a lot of new faces and you know and I thought that they would get you know because of being sir I thought that these new kids it would be a better look and I you know but it just you know maybe I am being a little hard on them but I just I just didn't like what I saw and um you know maybe they'll you know they have Norco next week and that's going to be tough so we'll just have to wait and see yeah and, and I Cal High did have Bakersfield ranked uh, 31st in their state rankings preseason. Um, they are not in their top 25 in the state anymore. And uh, I think Servite was somewhere maybe in their preseason. This is like their top 50 teams in the states. They're not ranked in the top 25 uh, anymore as well. So, um, but hey, uh, all things considering then, it was important that uh, that Servite got that win. Uh, if, if that is, if they did struggle and the, the opponent wasn't good. Um, they're fortunate maybe to get a victory, So, and they did get one. Um, all right, let's uh, wrap up our uh, review of Week Zero in the Trinity League, and we thank all the Trinity League fans for again joining us here on the Trinity League Football Podcast. The game I was at, which uh, was Jay Sarah, really impressive. Um, 49-7 to victory against visiting Corona Del Mar. I... I thought this was maybe the best I had seen Jay Sarah play under um, Coach Harlow, who's only in his second year. But they played all three phases outstanding. They ran the ball. Um, they were great on defense, and they were excellent in special teams. Their, um, you know, the deep, you know, Chris Street was electric running the ball, and he's got some depth at running back. I'm sure you'll probably touch on that. Their defense, you know, only allowed one touchdown. There was one good drive by Corona Del Mar, and in, in, in that drive, the, their touchdown that Corona Del Mar scored was a recovered fumble in the end zone by tight end Mark Redmond. So they didn't make a play. They didn't run it in, throw it in, return it in. They they fell on a fumble in the end zone. Hey, they he Mark Redmond, touted outstanding junior, loved him out of player, and he hustled to get it, but they didn't, you know, that was how they scored. And then their special teams, they blocked a punt, which they um, – that the return for a touchdown was Calvin Mousset who blocked it. Storm Seeley re- returned it eight yards. It was a punt from about the own, Corona Del Mar's own 35. They returned it for a touchdown. And they uh, Jay Sarah also returned the second half kickoff about 85 yards and set up a, a Caden Bell short um, touchdown. And it was just, you know, we, we were high on Corona Del Mar, especially after we saw the summer league. I was at their passing league between these two teams. July 14th at the Redondo Tournament. I went up there mostly to see Corona Del Mar and Villa Park, two teams I'm high on um, in Orange County. And CDM smoked Jay Sarah that day. Um, Ethan Garbers threw six touchdowns. Um, John Murphy couldn't be stopped. Either could Mark Redman, but it was a completely different story. But, Scotty, did this game surprise you and impress you as much as it did to me? Uh, I wasn't surprised. I kind of uh, knew the outcome of that, of, you know, this game. You know, and the story here is the physical nature of Jay Sarah on offense and defense. Um, like you said, they, they played well on every all aspects of, of the game. You know, so much for passing league when it comes to real football. You know, that's that's what we all talk about. Um, <laughs> you know, because Jay Sarah was just too much for CDM's big three to do it all on their own. Um, and that's basically what happened here. You know, like Jay Sarah controlled the line of scrimmage. Um, they didn't need to do much with their passing game, um, attempting only 12 passes uh, for 103 yards and the two TDs. And then Street went, you know, went for 110 on 10 carries and a score. And then they showed their depth at running back with uh, sophomores Sammy Green and uh, Anthony Ward running for 130 yards between the two of them. Um, and then on defense, this was what was kind of interesting to me. You know, they brought out Tarek Luckett, 
right. um, to match up with John Humphreys, uh, right. which proved to be a good move as Humphreys pretty much was in check. He could never really get off the line. Um, I think he had 35 yards and catch and run was his was his longest gain of the night. Um, and uh, something to watch for here is it to watch to see if Luckett continues to do this because they're going to be playing a lot of teams that have um, multiple receivers. And um, there have been people have, have mentioned that, you know, Luckett's best position may be corner. Um, and he's kind of the same size as Elias Ricks. He's kind of that lanky 6'2", you know, 195. And to be a big corner like that is it, it is doesn't come around a lot. So, um, you know, we'll have to see, you know, if, if, if he becomes that um, two-way guy that plays uh, that's on the field and just doesn't come off because um, that's going to be kind of huge for them. And um, my, I gave – their grades, I gave their offense um, a B plus and their defense an A. I gave them the B plus just because they were fifty percent on passing. Um, but you know, just like Modern Day did, you know, they got it done with their running game and good defense. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, I want to ask you a couple questions about it, uh, Scotty. What do you think um, is uh, Luckett's best uh, position for college? Because you have seen him play a lot. You've seen you. You know, I see you at all the passing leagues. And you've seen him play a lot in the training league for a couple of years now. You know this kid pretty well. Where, where would you recruit him? You know, I, I would give him more of a, a, a look at corner. He just hasn't played a whole lot of corner. Um, and uh, I know he went up against Humphreys, and I know Humphreys. Humphreys isn't real quick. Um, he's more lanky. Um, you know, and I think, you know, Lucky was a lot physical with him. And, and, and so, you know, this week's going to be a telling a different story and we'll get a really good look, uh, cause he's going to go against some great receivers. Um, and you know, when you look at him on the recruiting front for receiver, he's not real high on a lot of lists. Um, you know, I know he has some pac 10 offers at some schools, but when you talk about all the top receivers, he's a little bit lower on the list. And I don't know why. I've heard a couple of reasons that, you know, there's something about his separation that's a little bit – he needs to work on a few things. But he is by far, you know, a really good receiver. Um, and, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. I know he's going to make a, his commitment, um, I heard, pretty soon. So we'll see where he ends up landing. I like him a lot at receiver, probably because that's how I've seen him more. Because I just think he's got, you know, he's got good hands, he's got a good frame, and um, he's physical. Um, so I, I I like the way he plays receiver. Um, he's battling, um, he battled cramps, so I know, and I, and, you know, so I know it's going to be, you know, he had to come out of that that game. One of his um, against Corona Del Mar, one of his uh, offers is in the Pac-12 was with Colorado. Um, but I, I, I come back to you. I think, you know, you, you've been pretty consistent saying it's how hard it is to play two ways in the training league. I don't know how this guy could keep it up. Um, really, especially, I mean, any position, but, um, especially in the, the, the outstanding receivers in the training league and then have to take on the outstanding defensive backs in the training league and try to get through a year and then get to the playoffs. That, I think that's asking a lot. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. You know, you know, that just right there. I don't know if he was you know, the cramps right there needs shows you right there that he was, you know, his body was gassed. And, um, you know, if he's going to have to go, you know, a lot of the times these players kind of go spot duty. Um, yeah. But it seems like, I, I don't know, did he play pretty much full time both ways? Because, um, I mean, that's, that is tough to do. I mean, you bet, you know, and it's with, with the being in the early, you know, with the weather and the humidity we've been having, you know, that's going to take a lot out of you. Yeah, he pretty much did. He got a couple plays off, and then by the second half, early in the second half, he came out early after halftime and really started stretching, and he lasted a couple more series. And, of course, the game was getting out of control, and they got him out of there, and they didn't need him. Um, another guy that played corner, which was an interesting guy, cause you don't, and he was easy to spot because of a few things, but they also played sophomore, um, this is Jay Sarah, uh, Zama Jay Duncan. Samaje, Samaje. Yeah, he's the modern day. He's the modern day uh, kid, modern day transfer. Okay, um, and it, uh, um, forgive me if you mentioned him before. Yeah, I mentioned him a, a few. I wasn't sure if he was actually gonna, if you know, if he was gonna start okay. there. You know, I know he was in the running because I know we talked about their secondary being very young. And okay. I know there was a, you know, a couple of kids. There was another kid 
that I had um, that that was a transfer from Pacifica. But yeah. I'm not sure if he's eligible or if he's going to do his you know five day five game sit out. You know, yeah. I'm not sure if he played or not. I did not see Hagen Foreman out there, who I know had some kind of a, a hand wrist injury. Um, uh, he's a you know athletic kid. Oskis also plays baseball. Jay Sarah, but I noticed. Uh, Duncan, because I thought he played well. Um, he's 5'10", 180, and he, he wears number 44. So you almost look at him um, as like a linebacker with that number and his frame. I'd say he he definitely looks 180 pounds, and he played out there. And when things um, weren't going well, I remember one sequence where after that, I remember um, he wasn't on the, the field on that one play by, uh, and it wasn't on his side, but he wasn't on the field for, the, I think for the John Humphreys nice play that thirty five yard gain and they subbed him right back in. But I thought he did pretty well uh, throughout the game and I he caught my eye with his number his build. But um, maybe he's there other corner. Yeah, he's physical. Um, I saw some you know some of the film on that and he, I think there was two plays where he actually drove on the ball and batted the ball away. You know, you know yeah. almost close to picking him off. Um, but but he is a physical corner um and like i said i think he'll just get better as he gets more experience all righty well that is our week zero recap by scott barajas taking us through it with all our grades so great job scotty um before we leave uh, week zero um let's uh let's talk about some of the players of the week we uh said we would have so uh let's uh move it right back to uh santa margarita uh who are your offense and defensive players of the week for the eagles so I went with Peter Caselli um, with yep. the six touchdowns, um, and uh, he just looked really great out there. Um, on defense, I went with Blake Bianacci. He had nine tackles, including some a couple of big jarring tackles for loss. Yes, those are excellent picks. I, I can agree with those. Um, Moner Day um, has some candidates to pick from on offense and defense. What, who were your offense and defensive players of the week there? Um, I had to go Harper and Dollars. Because they Co. were both equally as impressive. You know, Harper had his highlight. His highlight was his 35-yard TD and a 10-yard run where he also had a, uh, a wicked uh, straight arm um, as ah. well. And then Dollars, you know, despite you know not counting his 87-yarder, that was his highlight in, in itself. And uh, for defense, I went with Brew um, for for his you know for mentioned plays on defense. Um, and uh, he also had you mentioned he had that straight arm too as well, um, you know. And if not for you know if not for Brew Moses Cipollona probably would certainly get the nod there. But those are my guys for for modern day. Yeah, and you were saying, you know, uh, before we started the show, how a lot of the impact Brew's making on defense is stuff that is not going to show up in the um, the box score where he's just being. You know, you might not see these high tackle totals, but we're talking about a guy that's disrupting the pocket, flushing the quarterback out, and other guys are making big plays. The offense is taken out of its rhythm and what they want to do. Plays get busted up because of Brew McCoy coming off the edge. Yeah, and that's you know that's something that's you know we're gonna have to we'll probably see a lot more. I don't think he's gonna be coming off the field much uh, this year. All right, Scotty, how about Orange uh, Lutheran? Uh, who are your your players of the week for the Lancers? Uh, you know, this one was kind of tough. I mean, you know, I think most time we would go with Talinsky, um, but you know, I'm going to go with the new name, Michael Puskas. He's kind of been an under the radar kid. He was one. Of, he's actually been one of the more consistent passing catchers this summer. Um, he's a small guy. Um, I think he's a junior. He, you know, he came up big with those two scores. And then defense. You know, Ethan Ray makes his return. He made several tackles, and then he came away with the two fumble recoveries. Yeah, we talked about how he could be a defensive guy to watch. Um, you know, for sure on the on the defense this year, um, USC commit at uh, at uh, tight end. All right, how about uh, St. John Bosco um, Braves? I mean, you know, you know, I think you'd go, you know, DJ, but I think he's going to have plenty of options, you know, chances to get that. So, you know, I'm actually going to go with Jake Bailey for his two uh, impressive uh, scores. You know, he's kind of that third option in that wide receiver core, um, and then defense linebacker Taylon Dalton. And he's actually a Rancho Verde transfer. Yeah, he's been under our radar. I don't know where he came out of. He, he had a pick 
he was in on multiple tackles and he had a caused fumble, you know, for a guy who was, you know, we hadn't heard of, but he sure had a great first game. And uh, Rancho Verdes, actually, they were a CIF finalist uh, last year. So um, look for him, you know, for that, with that brave defense as we go further on. So you haven't, you didn't know about him at all? No, he was, I don't know how I, you know, he, nobody mentioned nothing. I yeah. was just doing some research and I was like, I see this, you know, and I'm like, yeah, and I, yeah. So there you go. And and that's a big game uh, for Jake uh, Jake Bailey. He's a you know five ten, you know one hundred eighty pound um, you know senior. Um, he's got a Boston College offer. He's got a Brigham Young uh, BYU offer. So some good uh, some good visibility for a kid that's definitely gonna I'm sure playing for uh, you know for some more scholarship offers. And he certainly um, helped his stock there. Um, how about uh, your players of the week for Servite? Unfortunately, I, you know, I, I didn't have anyone for offensive player of the game, and I didn't have anyone that I could put for defensive player of the game. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, Survive, but <laughs> at least not this week. So, Well, let's put in Carrington um, because he, he had the pick six. He could, yeah. Carrington or Zenith Guys Centers would be would be those two, you know. I mean, I mean, his kickoff, I mean, that kickoff return was was kind of like a bobble, you know, and it, and it picked up and he – picked it up and then all the pursuit kind of was already um, on centers and he made a couple of moves and went down the sideline, you know, and he showed pretty good speed. And then, like I said, Carrington had that pick, did pick six. So, I mean, we, we can give centers and Carrington, um, but that was pretty much it for Servite. All right, let's go with Carrington centers. Do you know much about centers? I think he's a sophomore. He's a, he's a sophomore. He's the one of the kids from Los Al. Is he? Yeah. But he was uh, playing lower levels at Los Al? Yeah, he was on the varsity, so as a sophomore. Okay. I mean, as a yeah, as a sophomore. Okay, so big, uh, big play from a sophomore, and then uh, Jay Sarah rounding out our players of the week for week zero, offense and defensive players of the uh, week. Who did you go with, Scotty, for the Lions? Um, you know, I toyed with this back and forth. I probably would have went lucky, but I actually was going to go with Street because he ran. You know, he had that that long touchdown run and he had 110 yards on 10 carries average 10 yards a pop so i went with street defense i went with lucky for his matching up and yeah. utilizing you know humphreys to uh, limiting uh cdm to 146 yards passing yeah okay good one M- M- calvin could have been in the, the mix at Mous- uh, Mousset as well but i think uh you're right with you know luck it was the the matchup of the game. So, all right, Sky. Well, let's look at these uh, six games this week, uh, all coming up on Friday, um, aug- uh, August 24th. Um, big schedule. And um, let's start with that J. Sarah Calabasas game. That's at Calabasas, 7 o'clock. Um, you know, these are two southern section, um, you know, powers, really. I mean, Calabasas' program's definitely on the rise. Um so um, this is going to be the first game for uh, Calabasas. Um, they were ten and two last year. They're out of a, a pretty tough uh, Marmonte um, league. That's a league that has like Oaks Christian and you know f- you know um, Westlake uh, Saint Bonaventure. So you know they're also coached by Chris Claiborne. So they have a pretty notable coach. So Jay Sarah is going to have to make the road trip up there. But what's your take on this game, Scotty? Yeah, this is a very intriguing matchup. You know, because Calabasas is one of those teams who's been creeping up divisions, you know, and it's said this is the next team that's going to move into Division One. Um, they're playing Division Two. Um, in the past few seasons, Calabasas has arguably be matched its skill players with the Division One skills, and that's no different this year, which probably has the state's top trio. And I say trio. I was going to say duo, but now it's I mean, it's going to be trio with uh, Oregon commit senior Micah Pittman, junior johnny wilson who holds several d1 offers and they just picked up img transfer junior jermaine burton who also holds several d1 offers that's huge you know even without burton though Pittman and wilson would have combined for 112 receptions for like 1900 yards and 22 tds but with burton this makes calabasa very imposing and potent especially with the returning quarterback and Fresno State commit junior Jaden Casey, who's coming off 32 touchdowns and a 3,300-yard passing season. But what sets the difference is Calabasas is reaching that next level we talked about. 
is uh, you know reaching that D1 echelon are the linemen. So again, we're talking about linemen again. I mean, Jay Sarah finds himself in another matchup that's probably going to be one in the trenches, but Calabasas' skills are a big step up what Corona Del Mar offered. So it's going to take a lot more than you know just luck at playing corner. But um, this one's very intriguing. Um, I'll say nonetheless. Oh. Yeah. So is is Burton eligible? Um, that I'm not. I'm I'm sure he made the move. You know, yeah, yeah, come from. Yeah. He's coming from my yeah. IMG. Um, and uh, I had heard that he there was a few other schools that he had checked out, and um, but this one was not on the radar. And I and, and I thought he was actually going to go back to IMG, and then I you know find out that you know he's at Calabasas, and you know that's huge because he was only one. He was also one of a few juniors that was invited to um, um, the opening. So. All right. Well, I mean, we talked about how Jay Sarah's schedules uh, got tougher yeah, this year, um, going from Corona Del Mar and then um, now this Calabasas game. Uh, and of course, you know, I'm sure Jay Sarah would love to, you know, as we're talking about these receivers and these matchups, I mean, they're not going to have uh, Moonar McLean, um, it seemed like. I mean, last week, Coach Harlow was saying that he was out for a couple weeks. And um, I kind of got the feeling that they like to have uh, Moonar for league. Um, you know, and make sure he's healthy for that. He didn't dress out at all. Um, last week he was on the sidelines in, in street clothes, so there's no indication. Um, he's starting to practice. Uh, he, you know, that was the word last week, so I don't think he's going to play in this game. Um, and I certainly can understand. I mean, Jay Sarah's, I think they got a really good team, and um, they could do some do some damage in the, uh, I'm sure they're thinking they can do some damage in the, in the league. So um, I have a feeling that they might... Uh, they might not play him in this game. Another game on Friday, Scotty. Servite, they, this time they're again home, but they're at a different location. That's going to be Cerritos College, again on Friday night, 7 o'clock on August 24th against Norco. So uh, Norco also is 1-0, and just like the uh, the Friars. They won their opener. So what's your what's your think, uh, your take on this game? You know, yeah, Norco defeated uh, Williams 49 to 21 last week, you know, and then last year's survey took care of Norco 35 21. But I, this time around, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, you know, the big story of the summer was who was going to be Norco's quarterback. Um, you know, three year starter Nick Vasher or 6'6, 225 pound transfer Shane Ellingsworth. And it looks like Ellingsworth is a guy after he, you know, he took most of the snaps last week through for 186. He had three touchdowns. You know, Norco's always been known for its solid running backs and again they have another one in senior dj ford who ran for 229 yards um this time around i think norco is going to be able to run you know against servite small defense you know and i say small and you know because this is what servite has is play is been playing with you know up there their front four go 5 10 250 5 11 200 6 2 190 and then their biggest is 6 5 245 and then the linebackers are 5'8", 180, 5'9", 185, 6 foot, 210. And that's a very small deal for, for a Trinity League team. So, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, see, you know, what happens this week, but I think Norco is going to end up um, being on the winning side of this one. Okay. Well, that would be uh, that would be pretty big uh, for Norco to come in and get a, a win against a Trinity League team. Um, take that back to the Inland Empire. Um you know, and it sounds like Jay Sarah could be in some trouble against uh, Calabasas. Um, do you think? You think? Uh, you think Calabasas is going to win that game? I don't think so. I think. I think it will be. I still think Jay Sarah will will take that one just because of they've been able to control if the, the within the trenches, and I think it may be could be a higher scoring game. Um, but I, I would be surprised. I would be really surprised if Jay Sarah totally, if they dominate and take away all those skill guys, then I will be very shocked. And that was something that we should take into account if Jay Sarah can do that. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure. That, I mean, that ground attack, uh, I mean, you talk about trios. I mean, Jay Sarah's ground attack, that looked pretty special. <laughs> Their uh, their running backs. Uh, yeah, I didn't, that, and as I said, I don't know what you, you know. I mean, we don't have anything you know great as far as what Calabasas has as far as their linemen go. So um, we just have to you know, for what I know before is that that's always been the big difference because they're not even they're 
right now, I think they CIF has them ranked, I think, five or six in Division Two, which, you know, is a lot lower. You know, Norco's a lot higher than them, and I think Norco has a lot more question marks than Calabasas does, so... Yeah, the other, you know the other Division Two teams, you know Upland, uh, is you know touted Division Two team. They they beat La Habra to open up. Um, Tesoro has another Division Two team that opened with a nice win over Edison. Um, I saw Steve Fryer voted Tesoro in his top ten this week. I think he had him ranked eighth in Orange County. So um, those are a couple other um, you know D two teams. Um, all right, let's uh, let's continue on the schedule with. Uh, Another Bakersfield team is going to be uh, hooking up with a Trinity League team. So St. John Bosco hits the road this week on Friday, and they head up to Garces, uh, Bakersfield. What's your th- thoughts on this game, Scotty? Yeah, it's going to be the same ugly mess as yeah. last year. Uh, I think Bosco dumped them 63-0, and it's pretty much going to be the yeah. same thing once again. And that's all I have to say on that one. Yeah, and Garces is uh, 0-1. They're, uh, they're a Division II team from the Central um, you know, uh, well, they're, uh, well, Central California team, uh, they, um, lost their first game. They're not very highly, uh, ranked, um, you know, and, uh, let's see their opening round score, opening game, uh, Garces, um, see 27, 14, they lost, they lost a Bakersfield Christian. Yeah. Um, so, um, there you go. Um, all right, let's look. Let's move to these heavyweight games, the the big three games of the week. Let's uh, let's keep it out in the Inland Empire. So you got Centennial Corona um, coming in with some momentum, um, taking on Orange Lutheran at uh, Orange Coast College on Friday night. Um, what's your thoughts on this game, uh, Scotty? You know what? It's pretty much going to be. Um, you know, if you thought that. San Juan Hills defense was a challenge. Wait till they get a load of CC's defensive front. You know, defense was a story for Centennial last week. You know, they held Chandler's quarterback and BYU commit Jacob Conover to 15 out of 33 passing for 133 yards, and they forced 10 punts. And then uh, Akili Ali Maliki and Carter Freeland both combined for 430, 403 yards with Gary Bryan accounting for 295 and two scores. You know, and then they, the rushing game combined for 103 yards. Now, if Olu can withstand CC's front seven, you know, I think, you know, Olu will have that, you know, be right in there. But if they can't, they may be in for a long night, you know. Um, CC's, you know, Centennial's front as opposing as any top dogs in the CIF. I mean, they have two bookend defensive ends, you know, sophomore Corey Foreman, 6'4", 250, and then the, the Oregon commit, Drake Jackson, and he goes 6'4", 250. You know, and the, and the story here is that is that Centennial has always been, you know, that, that machine offense, and that's different this year. They're going to be led by their defense, and, you know, their defense kind of slowed down you know, a Chandler team who was nationally ranked or highly ranked. Yeah. Um, you know, and they, they just, and the, and the offense will take some time getting used to it. They, they seem to be trying to find that who's, you know, which quarterback will, will they seem to have more of the running quarterback and the more of the, well, of the passing, but um, it's that defense that's going to make the difference. So it, it, after what happened last week with Olu and what happened with Centennial, now it's very interesting because if we talked about what was going to be in the beginning of the season, we thought oh, Lou would run away with that being Centennial had had questions. Not so yeah. sure now. Yeah, maybe uh, Orange Luther was just playing it really close to the vest, uh, knowing that they got this Could big be. Centennial game. Because um, after this, um, you know, Orange Lutheran has uh, Vista Marietta, which is probably the you know most likely uh, you know it could be their easiest uh, non-league game. Uh, uh, well, uh, you know, San Juan was supposed to be their easiest one, and then Vista would be their second easiest one. But that's who they they play after this one, and um, so maybe uh, maybe the uh, the Lancers were keeping something underneath their vest. But um, you know, we we'll, we will see about that game. Seems like another tough one for the Trinity League. I just guess just get the feeling with these tough games, the chances of the Trinity League going six and zero again uh, are not uh, are not too high, huh, Scotty? No, you're right. You know, and going back to what you said about, um, you know, uh, Olu not showing anything. 
you know, I, I believe some of that, you know, after you say that, because I, I know a lot of times before big games, a lot of teams don't like to show anything when they go into a big game um, where they've been practicing. You know, I know coaches never say they've been practicing for other opponents before, you know, you know, their actual opponent for that week. Um, but it could possibly be, you know, like you said, a little letdown, you know, maybe, you know, knowing that they ain't going to get up for that Centennial game. Yeah. So... All right, another uh, big game going to be down at in South County on Friday, August 24th. That's Mission Viejo, Diablos playing host to Santa Margarita. These teams have played the last couple years. Um, yeah, they played the, at least their third year in a row playing um, with uh, Coach Fisher. Um, but, you know, now it's a new regime at Mission Viejo led by Chad Johnson. Uh, Diablos 1-0, just like the Eagles. Um, they beat uh, Liberty Baker so pretty handily. In the uh, in their opener, had a 96-yard touchdown interception return by Keely Arnold. Um, Pharrell is back running well. Um, the running back, uh, Joey Yellen, was over 200 yards. Looked pretty good. Um, so it seemed like a pretty solid effort by um, the Diablos. Uh, what's your take on, you know, uh, like you said, I, and it's probably a good observation, Santa Margarita has taken a step. They seem better to you, Scotty, but are they better enough to beat Mission Viejo? You know, that's going to be the question. Um, you know, their physicality is, is going to be, a, it's going to give us the, the, probably, you know, it's going to be their test, you know, and it's going to give us the answer. Um, you know, I think this is game would be closer than anyone thinks. Um, you know, I know they probably have Mission Viejo and Runaway, but I think it's going to be closer uh, than anyone thinks. So, and, you know, as Santa Maria made that big strides, and I think the emergence of Peter Caselli is going to be huge for the Eagles as as he progresses this season. Um, you know, but if Ar- uh, Mission Viejo's Arnold Forrest and Pharrell are making big plays, you know, like I said, it could be, you know, there could be a, a shootout. I don't know. You know, we'll have to see if, if Santa Margarita's defense has that much be- uh, in them because I know they got right. 21 points, um, and I know Michigan's a lot – better than, than what Downey was and has no right. weapons. Right. But, you know, I, I just I, I have a thinking that this game will be closer than what we thought going into it last week. Interesting. Well I hope some Diablos are listening to the Tree League football podcast, but I doubt they are. But we'll see if we have some diehards. But I think, you know, obviously I think you start to think about this matchup, you think Peter Costelli, super sophomore, taking on Joey Yellen, Arizona State commit quarterback. But you know the thing with the Diablos is that they have an outstanding defensive coordinator in Brett Pat Brett Payton, and you know he's going to dial up some interesting things for the young sophomore. They're going to disguise coverages. They're going to probably come after him with some super blitz. Um, they have people in the secondary. They have defensive backs that they can do some different things. And I think we're going to get a, a much better read on uh, on Costelli um, in this game. You know if he can. If he can thrive against a mission defense with, with uh, Brett Payton uh, bringing some people, um, one of the guys that played well for the Diablos, you know, came off the edge as Lance uh, Kennelly um, was a junior defensive end, um, had a really good game uh, in their opener. He had uh, nine tackles, had a sack. Diablos have uh, linebackers. Sir Barnes played well, nine total tackles. Um, they have some linebackers. They have defensive backs with Achille Arnold. Jojo Forrest. So, but it will be interesting, um, you know, but it's not like Santa Margarita is not coming in with any momentum. So I agree with you. Um, this could be a really good test, I think, for both teams. You know, uh, Mission Viejo, Division One team. So I think we'll get a really good read on them um, as well. Yeah, you are right. I mean, I, I did, you know, that is true about Caselli being a, a, his second start. Yeah, they're going to, Mission's going to come and, um, you know, throw coverages at him. So we'll see how well he does against that. Yeah. And, you know, of course, Mission went all the way to the Division I uh, semifinals last year, got knocked out by Modern Day. So um, we won't, you know, they won't really cross over with uh, much Division One after this. Uh, Diablos play La Habra, uh, Villa Park, and Upland, um, Divisions 2, 4, and 2 um, before. Oh, actually, you know what? I, I take that back. I, I knew that, yeah. The, Another game they do play in the Trinity League is Olu. So that, I'm sorry, excuse me, the last 
uh, non-league game for the Diablos is Orange Lutheran. So we will be talking some more Diablos on the Trinity Football Podcast. So this will be insightful for uh, for Olu. And of course, last year in the D1 quarterfinals, Mission Viejo knocked off o- o- Orange Lutheran. Um, so there you go. All right, Scotty, and now the national game of the week and uh, probably the best game in, in the in the week um, overall in the, in the nation, in my opinion. Modern day, taken uh, on the road, going out to Las Vegas to take on Bishop Gorman. This is going to be the Gales' first game of the year. Last year, uh, we know what happened. Bishop Gorman um, came off, you know, with a lot of hype, came into the Santa Ana Bowl, and they had a real tough go uh, early in the season. Modern day, modern day got them pretty good, 35-21, um, you know, Bishop Gorman had been undefeated the previous year. Um, they had been racking up some national titles, and that's where that's exactly where Modern Day went last year. And they went fifteen and zero. They won a national title. I got to believe Bishop Gorman is obviously quite upset about that game still. And it's not easy to go into to Bishop Gorman's house, just like it's not easy going to the bowl and trying to beat Modern Day. But Bishop Gorman has been highly consistent national program. What do you think about this game, Scotty? You know, yeah, they're they're coming off that thirteen and two season. You know, they lose a lot of firepower on the offense and defensive skill players. Yeah. Um, but they do return five starters on offense, led by three offensive linemen, headlined by UCLA commit Bo Taylor, he's six five two ninety, and Kale Briggs, he's a six four two eighty seven, and then Jordan Mack, six four three fourteen. You know, and they're going to help pave the way for their returning running backs, Junior Ayakaya Ragsdale. Who he ran for like over 400 yards last year, two t- six TDs, and he actually may eventually be able to take over their number one role over uh, returning Amon Cianelli, who led the team with 900 yards rushing and 19 TDs. So Ragsdale is actually said to be a legit D1 back, and he holds two Pac-10, 12 offers along with a BY, BYU offer. Um, you know, but the key is, you know, they don't return a quarterback. Um, they do, re- you know, a newcomer is going to be a dual threat QB, Micah Bowens. He's only attempted 25 passes last season. Um, and then on defense, they only return two. That's a Stanford commit DB, Kyru Kelly. He's a, actually, he's the son of uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers DB, uh, Brian Kelly. Um, and the other returner is defensive end Falcon, Kai Maituatelli, um, and they did, however, pick up a four-star D lineman from Hawaii uh, transfer about 20 D1 offers. So on paper, modern days probably looks to be the favorite, but you know, all things go out the door. Come 6 p.m. in that 100 100 degree uh, desert heat, you know, um, you know, modern day has that one game under their belt. You know, like we said, to Gorman, you know, this is going to be their first action, and they've probably been, you know, prepping for modern day. Um, you know, withstanding the heat and that Gorman offensive front, you know, um, with the more balanced passing game, modern day probably should be uh, coming out on top of this one. Well, it's going to be a huge test for them, especially, you know, a lot of the new faces on modern day. Um, they're gonna, it's not going to be uh, like Bishop Amont going on the road. I know modern day has really been pushing and um, throughout the summer, Coach Rollinson's mentioned it several times about their conditioning. He's talked about practicing the heat. He's talked about pushing the conditioning. And some of the new guys, you know, going, wow, this is what you guys do. This is how intense it is. And and Coach Rollinson has put it out there that this is what we do. And you got to get on board with us. you got to trust us. This is how we, we prepare. It's intense. And, um, you know, that's been that's been some of the, the buy-in that the Monarchs have had um, to do. So, um you know, and we know we know that modern day hasn't been completely at, at full strength yet. So it'll be interesting. That that could have been another thing. Uh, the Monarchs um, weren't full strength in their last game against Bishop Gorman, um, Bishop Amont. Maybe they have a few more guys uh, eligible, uh, you know, available to uh, to go this week. So it could be interesting if a couple of new guys, uh, you know, are, are able to help out the Monarchs. Yeah, I you know everyone you know will be back. Um come this game so uh, I think even the uh, the injured guys um, you know it's just it's just it's going to be an interesting you know like you said some ESPN's national TV game you know everybody wants to do you know play their best on TV uh, so it, it, you know we'll, we'll have a good time down down in the desert definitely looking forward to, to going out there and see if uh, I maybe it'd be quite a feat for uh, modern day to get this victory um, you know after this they come back and they play La Mirada. 
um, on the road at La Mirada, which is going to be a really weak game. Um, you know, La Mirada just lost a close one to El Toro last week. And then they uh, they play host to St. Mary's, and then they get ready on the 21st for that big um, ING uh, tilt um, back at the Santa Ana Stadium. So this is the first big one where uh, they got to get this one, um, you know, to kind of help set that stage a little bit more for the IMG game. Um, but like we said, La Mirada already lost. St. Mary's has of Stockton hasn't played. Um, they're good, 11-3, and three, but Modern Day handled them last year. So do you think if, Scotty, do you think if Modern Day loses this Gorman game, uh, which I know you like, you like them to win, but does that, do you think that will start to take any of the shine off that IMG? Or even if Modern Day had a loss coming to the IMG, you know, that'd still be a scary, uh, you know, such a hyped game anyway, though. Well, the shine's already off the IMG game, as uh, I don't know if you heard, IMG lost their scrimmage. Um, they actually put a scrimmage last week, and they played it in, in a game-like conditions, first half, second half, <laughs> and in the, they ended the score ended up being 33-30 they, uh, to a team in uh, Columbia. So I guess they, they you know, they got blown out in the first half and the second half they they kind of they, they scored more but but if you combine both scores they they got beat so and one pool actually dropped them for that even though it wasn't considered wow. uh a uh, actual game um they got dinged for it so uh so that's already that's you know that's <laughs> you know it's just a scrimmage but i'm just saying you know yeah i mean i think some of the the, the lust would would come off of that um you know if if uh if anyone, you know, lost the, the the game, I mean, you know, it's it's going to be interesting just for the, because because Gorman doesn't have any, you know, all their the word is is that their lower level kids are all big time. They're okay. Just un, un, they're just undiscovered kids. So if those kids step up and are they're the ones that can you know that make the plays, then that's going to be the difference. Um, but as far as who they have right now on paper, my, my modern day's favorite. So, all right, well, should be interesting. But of course, only where you get the information about IMG losing uh, losing a scrimmage is from Scott Barajas on the Trin League podcast. I did not know that, Scott. I hope some other fans uh, are getting all this information as well. And Scotty, great job tonight, man, and uh, bringing the knowledge once again. Good job. Oh, you're welcome, Dan. I'm, I'm glad to. Uh be a service for everybody out there well you definitely are some great insight get us more excited about these matchups it's a huge week in the trinity league you know um so definitely gonna have a lot to talk about and um scotty i uh i'm sure i'll talk to you before that but i'll be looking for you in vegas and um you know uh looking forward to a a great uh, trip out there and uh some fun football on friday all right, sounds good, Dan. Well, I'm looking forward to it. All righty. Well, for Scott Barajas, I'm Dan Albano, and thanks again for listening to us on the Trinity League Football Podcast. 